Thank you. We have been working for 13 hours from 3 a.m. We lost hope and we started heading back home. I took one more step. I mean one more step. I just saw something huge. It was a lion attack. I had another warrior say, It was too late for me to look on the side. The lion was already on top of me, kicked me three meters up in the air, and by the time I looked up, one of them, I just had one warrior say, Edward Morani, he's dead. He shaked me off. All the jewelry that I had were completely off, and that was a moment that I thought that I was dead. In the Maasai culture, Warriors, we are not allowed to go to the hospital. It's completely a taboo. When you go, it's like you are no doubt in the society. They tried all what they can to treat me in the village. They tried all the natural medicine they could treat me with. And my left leg kept on swelling and swelling and swelling. The elders, which are very strong backbone in our society, they decided to make a decision that if the modern medicine, if the hospital is the last Solution for him to survive, let's make a conclusion and take him to the hospital. Three days we walked to this modern, nice hospital, whereby all the people who worked in this hospital, they were non Maasai. They looked at my leg and they said, we have never seen a case like this. The leg was completely numbed, and they had to call a volunteer doctor, which I heard or I learned later, he was from Britain. He came and looked at my leg and he said, Wow, this looks interesting. It's beyond repair. And he told one of the senior doctors in the hospital, I think the only option for this person to leave is to amputate his leg. That was when I stood up in the bed and I said, no, 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 no. And he said, all this long that I've been trying to look for someone to speak English, you speak English? <laughs> and I told him, yeah, I went to school, but because of the rite of passage of every Maasai, I decided to be a warrior because when you become a warrior, you feel powerful. The whole society is looking at you, and you, you provide all what the society needs, and security, entertainment, and you can get what you want as a warrior. This is really interesting. You tell me whatever it will take. If you get, get healed, I said, I'll do whatever you want. We became friends, one month and a half in the hospital. And he told me that I'll try all my best, but you have to promise me to go back home, shave off your head, and go back to school and dedicate all your life into conservation. In our culture, when you shave your head, it's a big deal because when you leave culture and go to education, it's like living in two worlds. And everybody was saying, what? All my age men were saying, this is not right. I did because I, I had to do it because I made a promise. I went to school for five years. And often, I go back to Loita, where I come from. Kenya is not big. It's made of 42 tribes, and the Maasai people are among the minority that lives among the 42 million people that live in Kenya. 450,000 Maasai that live in Kenya. I go every time, and I was lucky. I got married to the most beautiful wife in the world, as you can see. She's beautiful. <laughs> and we were blessed. We had children. I got a job in one of the most luxurious camps, I will say, in the world, Sanctuary Olonana, as a guide. What does it mean as a guide? My life went back into conservation. I meet so many people all over the world. In 2004, I drove my Land Cruiser to pick a client, and I was so honored that it was Bill Gates that everybody knows all over the world. We were blessed with four children. And I go back to the village, and my children were growing. And my wife one day told me that, you know what? Our children are growing, and they need to go to school. I told her, I will sleep, and I'll give you an answer tomorrow. I did not even sleep, trying to think a way that I can convince my wife that our children will get educated. The nearest school to my village is 60 kilometers. There are only two options. For us, never to educate our children, or for us to move away from my culture and my people and educate our children in a town. And I said, this is not right. My children will grow not knowing their grandparents, their cousins, their aunts. I have to find a solution. 
I went back to work. I spoke to a lot of uh, government politicians. I went to many offices all over Kenya. And I said, I have an idea, and nobody is going to stop me from using this idea. I have a career. I have a job that I meet people all over the world. I'll speak to the world, and I'll change my community. In 2009, we built a school through an organization called Under the Acacia. And when we built this school, a teeny, teeny classroom, we had an opportunity to be able to accommodate only 40 kids in that school. That moment, I said, oh my god, I was so nervous. I did not know that anybody can send kids into this school. We started the registration of the children, and by midday, we had 118 kids that turned up to come to the school. I smile in my heart. <laughs> and I said, when I stood in front of all the elders, I said, this is the beginning of something good to my community. I worked so hard because, as you know, that Kenya have gone through a lot of challenges, constitutional. The government of Kenya announced to everybody that education is free. So I said, how can this be sustainable? I need this to be going on and on and on. We believe that God is nature. We believe in respecting each other and above all, respecting other people's culture. I say the Maasai people are not poor. They live over the land. A Maasai can pay for water. A Maasai can pay for health care. And what is the meaning of having a school if you don't have water? And what is the meaning of a school if you don't have health care? So we started a program in our community, and we elected uh, prominent leaders that are monitoring each project from water, health, and the school that all the projects are sustainable to each other. In Kenya, when you want to build a school, it will take only you one week, and you can instantly provide education to the young children. I know in America, when you want to build a school, it will take millions of years for you to get a <laughs> license, millions of dollars for you to build a school. In Kenya, you can provide like instant uh, uh, education to the young children. I also encourage what we call women empowerment. Because in our culture, there are a lot of things that, like lion hunting, female circumcision, or cattle raiding, that the, the Western world or other cultures, they look at the mass and they say that these are not right. I believe that. But for my culture, to move forward, they have to change other ways of life. And I decided to build this community, which is an area of about 150,000 people. We still have a long journey to go. And my community, in two years, when we finish whatever we are doing, will be able to net about 100,000 US dollars after we deducted all the employees, which our institution will have about 60,000 people that are, I mean, 60 people that are employed to work in our schools. I don't want this to end. I want this to be a role model to the world, not only to Kenya. Whatever that is remote in Kenya that you can admire the beauty of when you went to later, 10 years ago, you can only see the trees and see the grass. I want it to be a role model that we can use to other communities. And above all, I want this to be a memorable moment that everybody who comes from a remote area should know that every human being, whatever you are in the world, you have the voice to talk to the world, and the world can change the community that you come from. And that moment, when the lion nearly killed me, I look back now, and I see that it was just the beginning of a new life. Thank you very much. <laughs>